Thank you, Phil. That was, uh, uh, I think we're really behind schedule now. And Phil's talk here, I think we're going to go on for at least a half hour talking, but uh, we never have enough sense when we organize these things to uh, leave maybe 15 or 20 minutes to discuss. The problem is, is we give another 10, 15, 20 minutes. To, the speaker always uses it right to the end so we don't get the discussion. But, no, I think here is a tremendous amount of thought has to go into the things that Phil said, things that are very uh, discouraging with respect to the decrease in the amount of uh, uh, research being, uh, money being uh, uh, going directly to the agriculture development. But now with the new data that uh, Phil has brought to us, we can have a better understanding of where these things are happening, uh, what uh, the GIS uh, data where you can see uh, where you're really getting returns or when you're not getting returns to where the problems are. This is a, something that the, uh, all the people that are working in policy and in the end make the decisions and where to put money and how to put money, this is sort of information that is an absolute must to be able to make progress and push us in the right direction, and especially when we're talking about Africa where we see these tremendous discrepancies and uh, Phil is saying China. I mean, you know, it's about time we wake up and understand that China is not going crashing ahead uh, for no reason at all as they're doing the right decisions with respect to uh, R&D and, and uh, pushing the country in R&D and somehow, I don't know how we're going to get it, but Africa get also there where they, they can make developments that are needed to push them forward. Okay, the next speaker is Yuda Kahana. Uh, Yuda is uh, a professor in the Faculty of Management and also in the Porter School of uh, Environment. Uh, his area is with respect to the uh, uh, business world, and his main contributions have been not actually in the region of food security, but in the questions of uh, industry and insurance. And now he is, uh, I think, moving into uh, the areas uh, other he's thinking about maybe possibly due to our uh, uh, turning to him on these questions using his expertise and he's uh, uh, a well-known and well-decorated uh, 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 professor and getting prizes uh, for much of his work and rather than, since we're running short on time, rather than to go into more descriptions of the uh, prizes and the things that you has, he will tell us some of the uh, Give us some information on the democratics, environmental issues of food security. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are running out of time, so I'll uh, try to speed up. Uh, last night I was working uh, until uh, late hours, uh, so my kids say that I like to work under pressure. The last version of uh, this lecture was a uh, uh, saved at 3.15 in the morning, uh, and this is a result of uh, the, the very interesting discussions that we had uh, yesterday here, and I had to change the entire uh, lecture because I just wanted to, to uh, get rid of many parts to save the repetition. Uh, another thing that I'd like to mention is that we are going to talk about a very uh, complex uh, uh, issues as you've seen already during these days, and there are all kinds of aspects here, and you can look at the problem from different uh, <coughs> points of view. Also, the animals are, this is a picture from two, two weeks ago in Africa, and uh, you know, the tiger was looking at me, the, the uh, cheetah, oops, sorry, the cheetah there was looking at me, where is it here? And he was thinking about the fast food that he might have having. Uh, the topics that I would like to talk are uh, related to the, to the saying, you know, that the past is history, the future is mystery, and the present is a present. And uh, we shall see that the present is not such a big present right now, and uh, it has already uh, many clouds coming uh, in. So I'll be talking at first very quickly about the, uh, the uh, waves, technological waves, and the, the industrialization and what are the results of this process on, on the uh, food security. Then we shall talk about the current pressures on the ecology. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. About the uh, pressures about the uh, balance, the ecological balance, 
then we should talk about the, the need to reboot uh, our, uh, our economy. And uh, I'll talk about uh, some comments about the sustainability. Everybody was talking, referring to, to, uh, to doing uh, more for less. And I don't think it's a right uh, concept, so we should talk about this. We should talk about seeing, and I'll explain what it means later on. The, it all started, when I started my career, I, uh, beside my, uh, my work as an actuary, as a PhD in finance, I, I was uh, the first uh, technological forecaster in Israel, and I taught it at the Hebrew U in the 60s. And uh, at that time, uh, Toffler, uh, the Toffler's book came in about the technological ways, and I think that it's a good starting point. Technological ways are very complicated phenomenon. We didn't experience too many of those during mankind history. And uh, each technological wave is a very powerful thing that has, is a multifaceted thing that has impact on many, many things. We started the, at first, you know, as a gathering a society, pickers, hunters. And uh, at that time, uh, I think uh, it really continued in, many, in most places until uh, recently. And uh, here is a, a true picture of the chief of the Sioux uh, tribe uh, from 1905. And uh, some people attribute, I don't know whether it's true, but some people attribute, attribute to him a remark that I don't know if it's politically correct today, but I'll, I'll still do it. Uh, when white men uh, find land, Indians running it, no taxes, no debt, plenty of buffalo, plenty of beaver, clean water, women did all the work, medicine men was free, Indian men spent all day hunting and fishing and no, all night having sex. And then he added, only the white man is dumb enough to think he could improve system like that. <laughs> And uh, that was the world, for most parts of the world, that was the situation until about 100 years ago. And uh, <coughs> then, uh, but uh, for major parts of the world, still, it was in the agrarian revolution. The agrarian revolution started probably around the 15 millennium BC. Most people think it was 10 millenniums, but in a recent visit to Mesopotamia, I uh, just have seen some really interesting uh, findings which show that uh, the agricultural revolution really started some 5,000 years earlier than what people think. And it, uh, until the 1970s, about three quarters of the, at the 1970s, about three quarters of the world population were still living in a purely agrarian environment. And, uh, <clears throat> and then Industrial Revolution started for them. Industrial Revolution, the second uh, big uh, technological wave, really started 200 years ago. But uh, in most countries, it really started to infiltrate only at a much later stage. And then came the third wave that uh, the Tofflers were forecasting in 1970, which already started its, its first steps at that time. Now we know that the third wave was not one wave, but rather a series of huge technological waves that we have passed through. Actually, we are just finishing probably the most amazing four or five decades of human history in terms of development and, uh, and big changes. The, I don't know if you see the picture here. Here is a person. And this is the, uh, the one out of 32 kilometers of the CERN project in, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, <clears throat> people in the past saw very little changes, if any. Uh, in my childhood, I uh, was thinking about becoming an archaeologist in Israel. You couldn't avoid it at that time because the place was not that populated and you could find coins and things everywhere. I have thousands of coins and things that I collected. 
two of the uh, of these uh, ceramic uh, oil lamps uh, represent the point here. The one here, oops, sorry. The one here, this model with the four nozzles was in uh, circulation for about 500 years, about 4,000 years ago. And uh, this one followed it and was in, in use for the same kind of model for about another 500 years. And uh, if you think that I'm talking just about the uh, very old, the ancient period, the same thing applies also until quite recently, until about 200 years ago. You were born and died and you haven't seen any significant change. You lived exactly like your parents. And, uh, <clears throat> and then the world started to develop really fast in technological terms. Many, many of you may recall this, uh, this uh, picture. This picture is taken from the very uh, famous book of The Little Prince by Exupery. Uh, the Little Prince uh, goes and visits uh, other planets next to him. One of the planets that he visits is the planet of the lantern, lantern lighter. It's a book that was written in 1943, just a few months before Exupery was uh, killed in a in an aircraft crash, he was a pilot, and uh, very re strange. How many of you have seen Lantern Lighter recently? Well, also in '43, uh, I don't think that they were that common, but there were still quite a number of uh, towns that were lighted <laughs> that way. So. The reason really why I show this uh, picture here is not just to show uh, the big change, but also another aspect. Because the complaint of the lantern lighter is very strange. He says, well, you know, my planet is revolving now fast. In the past, I put on the lights in the evening and they turned them off in the morning and I had a very restful and uh, relaxed life. And now, every two seconds, I have to turn it on and off, turn on and off, because my planet starts revolving really fast. This is really an analogy to the current situation. Our planet is really revolving, in technological terms, really fast. It's so fast that our leaders, our business leaders, and, our, and us, we really find it very difficult to, to uh, understand what's going on around us. And uh, let's talk about it. This graph, or another variation of it, was presented already twice, twice yesterday, but it's inevitable. It's the population growth, the red line here is the population growth. We see that the population growth in the last two centuries is amazing. The population of the world was very small over millenniums. It was hardly above 100 million around the, the year zero. This is the year 1000 year BC, so here around Jesus was born here more or less, so population of the world was about 100 million. And uh, then it grew to about 200. It grew continuously, but slowly. But the same rate of growth suddenly turned into a huge absolute growth. Just during this 20th century, we started it with a population at 1900. We started with the 1.4 billion people. We ended up in the year 2000 with 6.4 billion. Five times growth and uh, four and a half, five billion people added to the process in one century, more than the total amount of people ever born in the world since the first man, okay? This is amazing, and it's typical to many processes that we are experiencing now. It's called an exponential process. 
An exponential process is a process which has a constant rate of growth. Exponential process is derivative. That means the change is also an exponential series. And the exponential process can go for a, a very long period being unnoticed. People don't really understand that they participate in such a process. But toward the end of the process, the absolute change is so big, and it always happens just at the last moment. At that time, you have very short time to react. So unless you understand these processes and look at them in advance, you don't have enough time to correct for these processes. And this is a major point. Well, this is the age structure of population. Let's skip it. So the question is, are we coming? So this is the population of today, very crowded. And uh, <clears throat> then we come to Malthus' ideas. You know, Malthus was writing this, uh, his, uh, his, uh, his thesis is some 200 years ago, and uh, he envisaged a disaster to mankind because of shortage of food. We won't be able to supply the needs of the growing population. He was wrong because of some considerations. He, he ignored uh, incentives. He ignored technological changes. He ignored pricing uh, mechanisms. He was wrong. However, most probably we'll be facing something similar today. Let's skip this. This was an exponential process. Another thing that uh, took place, <coughs> well, I'm sorry for the Hebrew that uh, came in. Uh, in 1970, three, percent, three quarters of the population of the world were agrarian, and now it is in towns. Half of the world population, more than half of the world population, is now in towns. Actually, just a few months ago, I was in China, and uh, one of the Chinese uh, scientists had a presentation, and he started his presentation with an aerial view of his village. And it's, he showed his village in 1980. The name of the village is Shenzhen. And uh, he showed an aerial view of that village today. In 1980, it had 60,000 people. In 2010, it had almost 13 million people. This is Shenzhen. In four decades. Three decades, actually. Okay? Another thing that took place is the change in consumption. The consumption per capita has increased dramatically, but not only that, but the, cons the composition of the consumption has changed dramatically. Because we live now in towns, Everything has to be packed, it has to be preserved, it has to be shipped to us, and, uh, <clears throat> and we consume by far more per capita. Not only that, huge population joined the process just in the last four, cent uh, four decades. So the total consumption in the world is just enormous, and food, pro food is just one part of this game. Okay? This is another exponential process, the growth in consumption. And there are many others, energy, water, resource, other resources, uh, utilization, and also negative processes like the impact on the environment, air, water, land pollution. Another picture from the uh, little prince. He says that uh, he visited the lazy man's planet. And that lazy man had three, he neglected three little bushes that were just starting to grow, and he didn't take, didn't pull them out. These were the baobab trees, and you see what happened after a short while, and they destroyed his planet. Actually, baobab trees are, are useful, and they are not that destructive, but uh, but that is just a symbol of what is going on. Actually, I think that uh, Exupery was a very good technological forecaster. 
is not a children's book. It's really an adult's book. It's an exponential process, and it shouldn't be neglected, the growth of a baobab tree. So what about the future? The future could be very bright. However, it could be that it is the oncoming train here somewhere. OK? Maybe we are going to see a situation where these exponential processes that are now reaching a very developed stage are creating a big danger to us. Are we reaching the limits? Probably yes. That means that we are expecting to see some extreme situations in the near future. How near? I don't know. It could happen tomorrow. It could happen 20 years from now. I don't think that we have more than a few decades. Getting closer to the limits means that we have higher costs of everything. Higher costs of energy, higher costs for water, higher costs for everything, for food, whatever. Not only that, but growing dependency. Bernie talked yesterday about the question, should we keep my brother? Should I keep my brother? Yes, we have to. We have no choice because we, there is a growing dependency. Will it continue like that? We cannot foresee the future unless we invent it. But one thing is quite sure. The changes will not continue to be the same way it is because there will be a breaking point in some of these processes. I don't know which one will be the first. The second point that is related to these uh, technological waves is that each technological wave created new institutions, a new culture. For example, the agrarian revolution made people dependent on climatic changes, and they, they have to and they notice that it is related to the sun and other uh, stars and things. So they started watching it. They developed religion. They also had to develop cities. They had to develop allocation mechanism for irrigation and whatever. The current system that most of us are living in now, right now, the post-industrial revolution, didn't have the time to create the new institutions. And they will come soon. The global, what I call rebooting, will come soon. The book on rebooting will come in March. Let's say that I'm writing. A, what are the possible changes? It is possible, for example, that there will be a total collapse of the monetary system. Already we see alternative monies being developed in all kinds of places. Maybe the poor countries will have to develop new system, new monetary systems, some of them because of corrupt uh, and, and, and uh, management have reached very strange solutions. Uh, I just visited Zimbabwe two weeks ago, and they, I didn't bring it with me. They, I have a bill, a note, of 100 trillion Zimbabwe dollars. It was just before the, the big collapse of the country, and now dollar is the currency there. Uh, there will be probably a new way of democracy. There are new tools using the new mm, modern communication system. For example, Obama has developed, President Obama has developed a new method of communication with people. Uh, there will be probably new allocation mechanisms. The labor market will change dramatically because our generation and previous generations were assuming that everybody has the right to work and uh, to be employed during his or her lifetime. It's not necessarily a true assumption anymore. It's possible that many people will be unemployed over long periods. So food security will not be only the problem of very poor countries. It might be a problem of very developed countries. This, the modern city could be a terrible mousetrap. Imagine 
You know, take an example. We had an electricity blackout in New York several years ago. I interviewed some of my friends about just to learn a few lessons. It's amazing what happened there. You cannot imagine our life without electricity for more than a day. Because your telephone will stop operating, the switch walls will stop operating. In some places you won't be able to open your, your door with the electronic key. In some places you won't be able to use your computer. Your cell phone, of course, will run out of batteries. The, the time you flush the water in, in your toilet will be probably the last time you see water in your home. And uh, it's a nightmare. And living in towns, in high rises, could be a terrible solution. Could be a terrible place to be in, in such a situation, because you won't be able to go to the farms to collect some food. Think about these situations. Food security is just one aspect. And we discussed many of the issues I I don't want to go over it because just for, in order to save some time. So uh, necessary conditions for food security is not only the quantity, but it's also the quality and also the timing, the accessibility for it. It depends on many, many factors. It's a multifaceted uh, issue, like all the issues that I just mentioned. It's depending on many factors, on the technology, on the weather, on the means of the people to apply it, on the efficiency of the process, on the waste during the process, on how much a crop gets lost due to, to the wheat disease, or how much a crop is being lost due to floods, and how much crop is being lost because of inability to send it to the market because the roads are flooded or the river has just uh, broken the bridge or, uh, or whatever. And, uh, <clears throat> and how much food we throw away. One of the most interesting lessons that I had during the academy uh, of officers in Israel uh, some 45 years ago, we were in the field and we had breakfast, and the, the cadets were complaining that uh, we didn't have enough food for breakfast. Our commander, a good friend, he stopped the training for two hours. He sent some guys to pull out what we have thrown, two minutes. We started much late. Well, <laughs> I'm in the middle. A, he stopped the, the, the training and he said he, he took all the, the garbage containers, he threw them in a pile, and he showed the guys that the neighboring communities could live on what we have thrown away for two months. Okay? So we waste a lot. So I'll skip some of these additional uh, factors and because I like to reach uh, some other points. There are sometimes very in interesting and important solutions here. There are financial innovations, for example. I'll give you the, a, a simple example. I, I'm, I was involved in the, uh, a big project which was financed by the USAID in the 80, 81, 82, to increase the food production in South America. A few thousand people were employed on this project. I consulted it. The main idea was to increase the food production by technology, fertilizers, seeds, pesticides, irrigation, whatever. For that, you need financing. But who will give financing to the farmer that wouldn't be able to return the money? So the key issue was a financial issue. The solution was through insurance mechanism. In Israel, we just a few years earlier, we, we uh, used this mechanism and we formed an agricultural insurance program, very sophisticated program. I was a director there. And we used the same experience and we exported it. And we established insurance companies, the insurance in all Southern America, the insurance 
was used as a guarantee for the loans. It enabled the financing, and hundreds of millions of people suddenly increased their output dramatically. So this is probably some of the processes that, uh, that uh, Philip was referring to, R&D, but in a different direction. Uh, R&D is very important. Here is a new way to grow palms, control the water supply, give them the water and fertilizers exactly at the hour that they need it and the quantity that is needed. You increase your crop. This is a new lettuce factory. Okay. Of course, Africa and the developing countries cannot use such technologies at this point. The capital investment needed is too big and the infrastructure that is needed is too big. So, innovation. There are many threats on the, on the uh, food security. The first thing was, of course, the global warming, but this is only one aspect. Al Gore was our visitor here. We arranged a conference a few years, three years ago on, the, on energy. He was our guest here. But there are many other things. <coughs> Water. I'll skip this. By the way, this is a very interesting picture. This is in Lviv, a 900,000 people live in that town in Ukraine and they are getting their drinking water from a tanker that goes in the street. I took this picture last May. Drinking, drinking water in a big town. It's amazing. If everybody would live, this is a very well-known picture, if everybody would live like us, like people in the developed countries, we would need some three to five planet Earths. Okay? And these are numbers that were calculated by my friend, uh, Matis Vakernagel, from the Footprint Organization. And he calculated some measures for our footprint. But this is alarming. It's impossible. It cannot continue that way. Because many people join the process now. We don't have another planet. We cannot go like uh, the lupins when they have, to, when the place is polluted with, the, with too much uh, nitrogen that they produce in the roots. They have to go to jump to another field next by, but they cannot grow anymore in that place. We don't have another planet to, to escape to or to bring our stuff, oxygen from it. Destructive prophecies, I don't want to leave you with a very pessimistic view. Actually, I'm very optimistic about the possibilities. The, tr the only trouble is that people don't move unless there is a crisis. And there are always crises in other areas. So they become, they become more urgent and they are being treated. And the big crisis that is awaiting for us because of those exponential processes, we don't treat. Most people, the leaders, ignore this process. It's very hard to encourage them to operate, both the political leaders and the, the management. I believe that it is possible to make a transformation to these people. Most destructive process, most the prophecies about destruction were in, uh, intended to warn and not realize because people reacted to them. So there are many ways of doing things. I would just like to go to the conclusions. By the way, we have to change the goal. The goal is not just to be. The question is not to be or not to be. The question is also how to be. And the goal is not the materialism. The increased material wealth hasn't increased happiness in the world. So we have to look for other indicators and things. There are many people are, are crying for social injustice and justice and whatever. 
but uh, but we are facing a really big failure because the system, as I mentioned, our system is based on the capitalistic system, which is a product of the Industrial Revolution. And the tools are limited and they are not performing well because of many things. Lack of perfect competition, failure of certain price mechanism to, to work, the inability of some groups, mainly the developing countries, to participate in the process because of lack of means, and the misuse of our common property, which is priced inappropriately. Water in many places, even in Jordan, which is more arid than Israel, in most places water is free. It doesn't make any sense. Oh, come on. The complex system is a C complex society, economy, and environment. We cannot just solve one issue. We have to solve many things. That's why we need a rebooting of the system. How we do this rebooting? First, we have to change our targets. We should not just strive for maximization of GDP or GNP. It's multiple factors, quality of life, education, health, and whatever. Many measures of well-being, and we have to make the better, the life world better. Do you see something here? What do you see in this picture? Anybody sees anything? Not even one? Fly. Can you see the world fly here? Most people don't see it because we are used to look at things in b written black on white. So you're looking to decipher the black signs and you think about maybe about, oops, about that arrow there or whatever. But it's written in white on black. It just, you just have to change the way of looking and suddenly a new world opens to you. It's possible that we are living in an avatar situation, you know, in black and white, and we just have to make one step and we'll be coming to a multidimensional, colorful world. It's possible. It just, we have to change the way of thinking. Some people see already that it is possible. Try and go through transformation. I do a, many transformational courses to top management of corporations. In two, three days, we change their way of, of thinking, and they start behaving differently. They see that they make profit in a different way without hurting the environment. And you, thinking about corporate social responsibility, etc. Suddenly you see, suddenly you can fly. Okay? It's possible. <clears throat> People were talking, and this is a, almost the last point. People were talking about sustainability and about doing less, doing more with less. I think it's wrong. We should think about beyond sustainability. We don't have to think about leaving no footprints. The concept of doing less, doing more with less, means leave no footprint. Try to minimize your footprint. This is stupid. It's a negative approach. You come from a negative direction to that. You come from a guilt feeling to that place. You should think positively. We have to leave a green footprint. We have to improve. Subject to the rules of thermodynamics, of course, there are some limits, but we have to do things to, to leave positive footprint. This can be done also in food production. We have to reboot the system. What does it mean? When we reach the borders, we have to th change the way of thinking because we start becoming really dependent on each other. The capitalistic system tells us really to be very egocentric. We think all the time about the me. Just turn the word me, turn it around, and suddenly it's a we. And you have to start thinking global. 
is centric rather than egocentric. It's a different concept. It has to be done, and it can be done. Is beyond sustainability too idealistic or unrealistic? Though thinking that we can continue with the current system are the real dreamers. And really what motivated me to make this move some 15 years ago from my focus in risk management and the insurance issues and things and to go to the environmental issue is this question. My grandchildren would ask me, Grandpa, where were you in 2012? Thank you.